want to welcome you to the AMF Summer School Preview for MTDSX. This course was jointly developed by the IMF and the World Bank and funded by the Debt Management Facility. Its goal is to teach you how to develop a medium-term debt management strategy, or MTDS, and how to use the analytical tool that the IMF and World Bank designed to help you do that. In lesson one, you will learn what a debt management strategy can achieve how it is a critical part of both maintaining debt sustainability and meeting debt management objectives. The second lesson discusses what a debt management strategy is and how it provides guidance on budget deficit financing, taking into account the government's preferences for cost and risk. The third lesson explains how the analytical tool works and how it uses specific instruments to represent the government's debt portfolio in a stylized fashion. Lesson four takes a more detailed look at the trade-off between cost and risk across some different debt strategies. And the fifth and final lesson explains the key part of a debt management strategy document, from information on the debt portfolio to describing the government's chosen debt strategy. Register for the full MTDX course for free. I hope you decide to join us. If a country were to borrow more or less by contracting loans or issuing bonds in foreign currency or increase or decrease borrowing in domestic currency, the medium-term debt management strategy framework can help it assess how its debt service costs and risks would be affected. If a country were to increase or decrease the maturity of its domestic currency borrowing or borrow more foreign currency denominated debt on concessional terms rather than on commercial terms, the MTDS framework can support it in developing a debt management strategy that is consistent with preserving debt sustainability. Developing a DMS is the main objective of the MTDS framework. By considering linkages to key macroeconomic policies, the MTDS framework can help construct an appropriate DMS that maintains debt sustainability while meeting debt management objectives. For example, a targeted debt portfolio with clearly defined shares of domestic currency and foreign currency debt, or a portfolio that emphasizes increasing the share of domestic currency long-term debt to promote domestic debt market development. The Debt Management Strategy, or DMS, is the plan that the government intends to implement over the medium term in order to achieve a desired composition of the government debt portfolio. The DMS reflects the government's preferences on cost and risk. A DMS is often published alongside a government's budget or as an annex to the budget text. It provides guidance on how the government will finance its fiscal deficit and repay existing debt, principal, and interest. The strategies a debt manager considers should be reviewed to ensure they are feasible. This review might identify broader policy issues that effectively constrain the strategies. Even where the range of possible debt management strategies is limited, this evaluation of costs and risk is an important element of risk management. After the debt manager has assessed the cost and risk characteristics of strategies using the output from the MTDS tool, the results should be summarized, for example, in tabular or graph form. And a small number of potential strategies should be identified, presented, and discussed with other policy authorities, both fiscal and monetary. The impact of this strategy on financial stability and capital market development should be considered. Reviews may be conducted as part of a large meeting involving all the relevant authorities, or alternatively, they may be undertaken simultaneously with the debt manager interacting bilaterally with the relevant authorities. Fiscal Review 
The potential strategies and their associated cost and risk implications should be reviewed with the fiscal authorities and their implication for debt sustainability assessed. If the review with the fiscal authorities suggests potential risks to the overall budget or that debt sustainability or external viability appears to be at risk, the strategies may have to be adjusted. Alternatively, a review of the baseline fiscal projections may be required so that more fiscal space can be created. Monetary review. The potential implications for monetary conditions including their potential to support monetary policy objectives, should be discussed with the central bank. The anticipated amount of foreign currency financing and maturity may have implications for foreign exchange intervention, the exchange rate, and crowding out of the private sector. Other important discussions include the effects of the balance of payments and the level of borrowing relative to the anticipated level of international reserves. And if external debt sustainability appears to be at risk, the implications affecting the exchange rate regime. The outcome of such discussions may also affect the choice of strategy or might require an alternative strategy. Financial Stability and Capital Market Development Review. The potential implications for financial stability and capital market development should be taken into account. Financial stability concerns, for example, the exposure of the banking system, should be analyzed. The strategy's implications for any supplementary debt management objective to develop the capital market should also be considered. Let's consider an existing debt portfolio as at December 31st, 2019. For each instrument, we assume that we have the principal and interest payments until maturity from the debt recording system in their original currency. If not, we need to calculate these data for each debt instrument in line with the process for calculating cash flows. Step one. First, we have to create the representative instruments. In this instance, we use these 11 instruments where ST indicates short-term, MT medium-term, and LT long-term. Step two, we then allocate each debt instrument in the portfolio to these representative instruments as set out in the final column. We can illustrate the process of cash flow aggregation by looking at the first six years of principal payments. However, we cannot stress enough that for the MTDS analysis, it's necessary to include all payment projections until maturity. Step three, before we can aggregate by representative instruments, we need to convert all the cash flows into a common currency. To do so, we use the exchange rate at the end of 2019. Step four, aggregate by representative instruments. Once all instruments are in a common currency, we're ready to aggregate. If we look back at the existing debt portfolio, we can shade each of the underlying debt instruments with a different color to show which representative instrument they're to be aggregated under. So let's look at the grouping. Multilateral fixed. Two instruments, number one and number three, fall under this category. So we sum these two rows. Multilateral variable. We sum up two instruments, number two and number four, that fall under this category. Bilateral fixed, we can sum instruments number five and number eight. Bilateral variable, for variable loans, we aggregate number six and number seven. Commercial variable, no aggregation is needed here since there is only one instrument, number nine. And commercial fixed, again, no aggregation. There is only one instrument, number 10. International bond instruments, numbers 11 to 13, are aggregated here. Treasury bills, instruments 14 to 16, are aggregated for this category. For bonds, we can see that short-term instruments are comprised of numbers 17 and number 18, medium-term 19 and 20, and long-term numbers 21 to 23. Step five, we check that no information is lost. By comparing the total principal payments for each year, you will note that information is not lost. It's highly recommended 
that the user undertakes such checks. That is, confirm that the total principal payments using representative instruments is the same as the sum of total principal payments for individual debt instruments. Similar aggregation needs to be undertaken for interest payments on an annual basis. The output of the AT includes tables and graphs of indicators of cost, debt level, and portfolio risk exposures for each of the four financing strategies. We can use this information to compare the performance of the financing strategies against one another. We can see how different strategies contribute to managing or reducing cost and risk. Let's first examine how the four strategies that we just simulated for the Utopia case study perform under the baseline. At the top of the summary results worksheet, there is a table that provides key information on cost and risk for each strategy at the end of the strategy period, as well as against the current debt portfolio. The table allows easy comparison of what could be achieved under each strategy by the end of the strategy period. These are the results for each strategy under the baseline projections of market variables for the simulation. What can we observe? Do the results confirm to our expectations based on what we know about the macroeconomic projections, the different financing mixes represented by each strategy, and the relative cost of different debt instruments? We can see, for instance, the level of debt increases over the strategy period, no matter which strategy is selected. This is not surprising, given that primary deficits are projected. This tells us that debt management decisions, the composition of new borrowing, and the evolution of the stock of debt cannot overcome imbalances in the underlying fiscal stance of the government. Compared to a continuation of the status quo in strategy one, Greater reliance on external borrowing in strategy two contributes to a reduction in the cost of debt as measured in terms of interest payments to GDP or the implied interest rate owing to the lower interest rates on external debt relative to domestic debt. However, exchange rate risk increases in strategy two compared to strategy one. Conversely, Compared to a continuation of the status quo in strategy one, greater reliance on domestic borrowing in strategies three and four contributes to a reduction in exchange rate risk. But the cost of debt increases. Refinancing risk for the total debt portfolio also increases as domestic instruments are assumed to generally have shorter maturities than external instruments. The greater share of longer term domestic debt in strategy four relative to strategy three contributes to a reduction in refinancing risk, but results in an increase in cost. This information, which takes account of all the measures of cost and risk, does not necessarily tell us which of the four strategies is the best, but it plays an important role to help us to quantify the impact of our choices regarding the overall shares of external versus domestic financing and the mix of instruments within each strategy. Let us recap the information that should be covered in five main sections of a DMS document that we discussed in module one. Objectives and scope. This section describes the objectives of debt management, defines the scope of debt that the strategy covers, and identifies the costs and risks being managed under the strategy. The sole purpose of the DMS is to achieve the debt management objectives. Existing portfolio. This section provides the context of the existing debt portfolio, which is the point of departure for the strategy. It describes the composition of the portfolio in terms of its main cost and risk characteristics of the debt. This includes the mix of currencies, the mix of fixed rate and variable rate debt, 
the maturity structure and the mix of creditors and investors. The drivers of past trends and key changes over time should be explained. This section also highlights the key costs and risks that are to be managed. Debt management environment. This section describes the environment that the debt manager faces, including the availability of financing from different creditors and markets, and the outlook for interest rates and exchange rates. It describes the fiscal outlook in terms of the implications for the borrowing requirement. Constraints on policy choices for the debt portfolio should be discussed, including those related to domestic market development and shifts in the availability of different types of external financing. Analysis. This section provides a brief explanation of the types of analysis, both quantitative and qualitative, undertaken to support the decision on the approved strategy. Any limitations of the analysis should be identified. It is not advisable to describe the various alternative or hypothetical strategies that were considered or underlying quantitative analysis. If it is decided to disclose those details, this should be through a separate document such as a technical working paper. Debt strategy. This section explains the strategy that has been approved. It identifies the key elements of the chosen financing strategy and describes the composition of the debt portfolio that would result over the medium term from the implementation of the strategy. It should provide the rationale for the desired composition and how it will be achieved over time. This subsection specifies ranges, targets or desired direction of the cost and risk indicators that are being addressed by the strategy. Arranging the strategy document as described here and in Module 1 helps to ensure that all relevant stakeholders understand not only the debt strategy to be pursued, but the key objectives that guide it and the main features that have been taken account in its development.